This is Evolutionary Radio. This is your host, Trevor Karitzen. So before we start off today's show, I've been getting a lot of questions about why we named this podcast Evolutionary Radio. So the show is sponsored by Evolutionary.org. Evolutionary.org is kind of like bodybuilding.com for steroid users. There's articles, there's forums, there's things like that. But it's all targeted to an audience that has been lifting weights for a while, a much more hardcore audience than your typical bodybuilding.com. So evolutionary.org, check it out. Both me and Steve are moderators on there. Go on the forums. If you post up uh, any questions or anything like that, me and Steve, we're answering them daily. Um, and it's a source board, so you can openly talk about steroids. You can talk about steroid sources and things like that. Um, as always, my co-host Steve Smee is joining me. Good evening, fellas. What's up out there? How you guys doing? Do you want to introduce today's guest or should I have the honors? Go ahead and go ahead. We have another great guest, another uh, professional bodybuilder. How's it going? Brad, how's it going, buddy? I'm doing good. How you guys been? Good, man. Good, man. Hanging in there. So joining us today is IFBB Pro Brad Rowe. Um, lots and lots of people wanted you on the show, bro. Uh, you, got, you got a big following. I appreciate it. So first question for you is you got a huge sling on your arm. Tell us about that. All right, so uh, about two weeks ago now, I was out in Dallas for uh, Destination Dallas's five-year anniversary. That's the gym that Gasp and Better Body Zone. I was out there. I just recently signed with Gasp, so I was out there shooting for them. And on Friday, uh, towards the end of the day, we were doing our final shot of the day after eight hours of shooting, and Per Bernal decided that he wanted to put this gigantic tire behind me. Uh, it was a backdrop for the photo, and I was watching this little 130-pound assistant female who's the designer uh, purchaser for gas, and this other guy tried to move this tire, and I'm just not one of those lazy piece of shit fucking athletes that sits on their ass and watches people do shit. So I went over to help them, um, and as we were lifting up, it was just too close to the wall, and that sudden stop when it hit the wall just caused my bicep tendon to snap off. So... Um, you know, immediately, I knew right away, you know, I just, I heard the pop, you don't feel any pain. There's not a lot of innervation or a lot of blood flow to go through tendons. So it's really not a painful experience. It's more or less that noise of that pop is uh, something that you never live down. Um, but, you know, it's, it is what it is. And uh, it happened at the best time because I just finished competing for the year and I was kind of changing directions where I wanted to go. And we can touch base upon that. I'm sure you guys have enough questions, but uh, that's the uh, long and short of the story. How so what they, I was going to say, what they say um, is the prognosis now. How long are you going to be out? Uh, so I just had surgery uh, 12 days ago now. And doctors say 16 weeks full recovery. I'm going to say I'll be back in 10 to 12 weeks. So are you right-handed? I am right-handed. Uh, it was a little bit difficult the first couple of days. But to be honest with you, I am so much more mobile than I thought I was going to be. Uh, this procedure... And going through everything is fucking a hell of a lot smoother than, than I anticipated. So um, I've been 100% positive going through, like from day one, when it, even when it happened, you know, I was just like, ah, shit. But I never let it get me down at all. And, and I knew that in, a, in an age of social media, in an age of where you're trying to create content and part of a story, and, and a lot of followers follow me because I'm always beat up and banged up and always work around things. And all this does is just kind of, feed into the legend of me that just never gives up. So this is all a positive spin and I've been a hundred percent positive about this whole process. And, uh, you know, just putting out content for guys showing how I'm working around it, how my nutrition changed around it and how I'm getting through daily life. I only sat around the house for a day and a half and I was back to training clients right away. Cause I just had to get out of the house. I'm a go, go, go person. I think honestly, Brad, I think that's part of the reason why you have such a big following is you're just, you're just a positive guy. Like you don't let things get to you. And like, I've been following your career for a couple of years and you've always got some injury or something going on, but you never make excuses. I appreciate that. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm a grumpy bastard on my day to day basis, but like big shit in life and like my big perspective in life, I'm extremely positive about stuff. So, you know, if you see me in the gym, my head's down, I'm kind of grumpy, you know, that's just the, the instantaneous flash moment of things. But throughout life, I'm very positive about everything. And, and I know there's always ways to work on things. I know there's always people out there that have it so much fucking worse than we do. So, you know, and, and, and I'm surrounded by people that have overcome so much more than I have in life. So I just kind of look at them and, and realize that, hey, just keep pushing forward because life's just going to keep throwing shit at you no matter what. 
So talk to us a little bit about this injury. Does that mean you're done competing or, or what does that all mean for you? No, they say uh, 100% uh, recovery and, um, you know, that it actually could have a little better shape than it did before. Um, you know, so the, the tendon snapped uh, at the distal portion of the bicep, so just below uh, the forearm, uh, you know, like the inlet of your, your elbow. So what they do is they go in and they, they drill a hole through your radius bone and they sew some really high tensile strength um, wire pretty much to the tendon and they drop this metal button down through the hole and flip it so it acts as an anchor on the opposite side of the, the radial bone. So that really latches everything in. And they use that and they kind of tighten up the strings to pull that tendon down in there and stitch it all together. So it's, it's a pretty sturdy um, process right now. And then, you know, with 10 to 12 weeks of healing, everything kind of builds around it. Um, so I will be on stage next summer. You know, I, I want to do the Arnold in 2020. That's kind of my next bucket list thing. So I've been contemplating if I should just take the whole year off and focus on that. But uh, I feel like I need to get back on stage next summer. So I think maybe June, July-ish, I'll be back on stage 100%. Some, sometimes in life, though, like, because even professional athletes, you got to look at them. Like Cam Newton, for example, he tore his rotator cuff last year. He was out six months. He didn't even throw a football. And he came back last year and had a kick-ass season. Tom Brady blew out his ACL, was gone for the year, came back the next year, had a record year. So, I mean, you know, even like professional, any any sport, you know, they have these injuries. His ACL and coming back in nine months and rushing for 2,000 yards. I mean, yeah, Adrian Peterson, perfect example. And so it's like, you know, sometimes our body just punishes us, you know, finds a way to punish us and we take a break, but we come back. And it's like, you know, that's, that's one of those things, you know, people got to realize it. You always come back stronger, you know? What, what makes you so positive? Is that something your parents taught you growing up? Or is that just something that came, came to you? I think, I think it's just something that came to me. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to say that I had a, a, a bad upbringing, but I didn't come from much. And, um, you know, I've always been around, involved in sports, so I've always been injured. I mean, I was having surgeries as a sophomore. You know, actually, my... My first big surgery was I had uh, an inguinal hernia when I was in seventh grade. And I think I missed maybe like four days of practice and was back on the football field, you know, playing. So uh, I've kind of always overcome injury, you know, throughout high school, uh, broken ankles. And I tore my rotator cuff in high school and had an operation my, going into my junior year in high school and, you know, was didn't miss a beat. So I think I've always just had shit thrown at me. Um, and put my body through a lot and always been able to bounce back. So I just, you know, I, I've, I've never letting big injuries kind of get down because of, I've always, I'm like a cockroach. You know, you just, the more you try to kill me, the, the stronger I come back. Brad, one question I have for you is, it seems like you're injured a lot. Do you think that that's genetic predisposition? Do you think that's just because you train so hard that you're always pushing yourself to the max? Like, why do you think you're always going through some sort of injury? I, I definitely push myself too hard. And that's, um, you know, a realization that I've come to uh, when I was out in Dallas talking with, uh, you know, Guy Sister Nino, actually. And we kind of both have that same mindset. And we both kind of acknowledge that shit. You know, we're 35, 36 years old. You know, maybe we should change things up a little bit instead of going so heavy, so balls to the wall all the time, you know, kind of back off a little bit. But, you know, again, that's, that's where my passion comes from. Um, you know, a lot of the things I get hurt on are, are doing dumb shit, you know, but I like pushing my body You know, I still like doing athletic stuff. So, you know, you'll still see me doing box jumps and, and doing sprints and karaoke type stuff and a lot of lateral movement that's, you know, not best for the hamstrings and knees and, and things like that. So uh, I tend to get hurt doing things like that. You know, I, I hurt my back. I had taken, I, I had two herniated discs on my back and, and the initial injury was I had just taken six weeks off from training for when I was working with Chris Aceto. Chris is really big on his guys, like walking away from the gym for a long period of time, which is probably one of the worst things you can do because you go from not training at all to trying to get back into things. And when you have a mentality like mine, you try going hundred miles an hour. So there I was with Sean Roden and Ed Nunn. They were like seven weeks out from the Arnold and I had just got back in the gym and I'm watching them being little bitches doing rack deadlifts. So I jumped in and threw six plates on and start repping out rack deads. And I felt my back go on like rep two. And I was like, fucking don't stop. And I just kept going. 
And that's when I herniated my disc in my back, you know, just cause I just, uh, the stable iron muscles weren't strong enough. And, you know, I just, I, I, my form probably wasn't the best, but it's just doing dumb shit like that. That's how I get hurt. You know, I tore a hamstring doing uh pushing a sled. Uh, I had done a sprint down and back and everybody was like, Holy shit. You're still so fast for as big as you are. Let's get it on video. And then that next run, you know, full out doing a sprint with a, with a sled with like 120 pounds on it, my hamstring snaps, you know? So it's always just things like that, doing stuff outside the norm that we really shouldn't be doing as bodybuilders, but that's what challenges me. And that's what I love. And that's how I like to push myself. You're, you're married, right, Brad? Yes. I was just like, damn, too bad. Chicks take scars. <laughs> that's what I told my wife. She, like, we were going into an operation. She's like, you're not nervous. I'm like, no, it's kind of cool. She's like, what? I'm like, I'm excited about this. I'm like, it's just another fucking story. Like, it's like, Ooh, look at this car. This is what I did. You know, I, Oh, I, I've had this operation, that operation. I'm like, it's just, it's, it's a cool battle story. So Brad, this kind of segues into our first question. I'm going to ask you first, how old are you? Uh, just turned 35. Last okay. Month. So, um, <clears throat> this, um, we have, uh, one of your fans on the forum. He says, he's like, I would like to know how in the hell he keeps everything balanced, training clients, training himself, acting auditions, IFB, IFBB level, modeling, being a husband, new house, and now a bicep injury in the mix. He's a busy guy. And that's actually a really good question because I notice a lot of people, like, um, if you give them, like, two things to do for the whole day, they literally won't accomplish shit. And it's like guys like me, guys like you, guys like Trevor, we can accomplish 20 things in a day. And I, I don't have an explanation for it, but maybe you can help this guy out and give him an explanation. I think it's just how you're wired internally, truly. I mean, it's just one of those things that you got it or you don't. I know people that don't have jobs, have money to their name and don't have shit to do and tell me how, oh, I had such a stressful day. I had to go grocery shopping and, and, and had to cook my food and I just didn't have enough time. I'm like, really? You don't work? You don't go to school? You All you do is just train and, and you are stressed out about that? I'm like, I fucking got a workout in, trained three clients, went to the grocery store, took care of my dogs, did a load of laundry all by nine o'clock. Like, what the fuck are you doing with your life? But I you, don't, you, you know, I, I don't rise to the circumstance you put yourself to, right? It's kind of like when you're five and you're trying to button up your shirt and you're like stressed to the max. You're like, holy shit. Like you miss a button and you're like freaking out. And then when you're like 10, you're like trying to learn how to tie a tie. And it's, yeah. so it's like, if you, whatever circumstance you're in, you'll rise to the occasion. But if you don't ever push yourself, you're right. never going to grow. And, and I think it's the environment you're raising too. You know, I, I come from a blue collar family where everybody worked like dogs. And, you know, I, I always had to carry a job from age 11 on, you know, I was driving around mowing lawns. I was playing sports, going to school. You know, I was a three sport athlete all through high school, plus kept a job, worked every summer break, every spring break, every weekend that I could, even through college, played football, plus all in sports and carried a job. You know, never went on a spring break or anything like that. I always just went home to work to make money. So it was just what I was brought up with and knowing that I want more out of life. And the more I sit on my ass, the less I'm going to get out of life. So I think that's, you know, that's another thing. I'm actually more stressed when I'm trying to sit home and relax. Like me and my wife, in order for me to relax, we have to get out of the house. I have to go to dinner someplace or like I have to go to the movie because I'm just sitting home and try watching a movie. I'll just start doing shit. I'll find random shit to do. I'll start randomly cleaning or organizing shit because I just cannot sit down. That's just not how I'm wired. My mom's the same way, you know, so I think it's, it's a family thing and how I was raised as well. Where, where did you grow up? Uh, New Hampshire. Oh, okay. Was that like, um, like kind of like out in the woods or is it more close to the city? Uh, so I'm, I'm one town over Massachusetts border and it's a, uh, a beach community. So very touristy during the summer, um, obviously freezing cold in the winter, but about 45 minutes North of Boston. So, you know, not the boonies by any means, but we were a, uh, a fishing community that uh, got stricken with drugs and alcohol and everything like that. You know, the, the heroin epidemic is huge in my town, uh, losing people left and right. But, you know, we're, we're just a typical blue collar community. So, Brad, another question we've had a lot of people ask is you went from Chris Aceto to Matt Jansen to now prepping yourself. What made you decide to take the realms and, and be your own coach? So when I first left Chris, uh, I kind of always wanted to do my own thing. And I just, I think I just got a little too scared. Um, 
I'm one of those people that just think conditioning, conditioning, conditioning. And I was just so worried that I would push myself so hard that I would like step on stage, like 190 pounds of bag of bones. Um, you know, so when I was really debating when I wanted to leave Chris, uh, and it was nothing against Chris at all. Um, I just, I felt like I needed to just do something different in my career. You know, it's, it's always great to, to try new things and learn new things. Um, me and Matt had been communicating a lot. Matt had reached out to me. He saw that I was dealing with some digestive issues. That last year I was with Chris, uh, I had a ton of digestive issues. Um, almost for a full year, I couldn't eat anything. Uh, I was living off of uh, raw egg whites and whey protein and white rice. And that's it. Anything else. Anytime I touch solid food, I would just blow up and get gassy like crazy. And I've had a history of IBS my whole life. So, you know, I've dealt with bile issues for a long time. And Matt's always kind of would chime in and, and give me some advice here and there on how to help out digestion and stuff. And uh, kind of one of the final straws of Chris was I, I couldn't eat anything. And, and he was just like, you just got to force it. You just got to force feed. And I'm like, yeah, that, that's not going to work. So that was kind of like my, it's time to move on in a different direction. And like I said, I, I kind of tossed back and forth what I wanted to take over my own prep or not. Um, but me and Matt had kind of built a good relationship and I was like, all right, I'm going to give this guy a chance. You know, he's doing good things with, you know, he was with Justin Compton at the time and working with Dallas and a few other people and, and they were making good improvements. So that's when I decided to make the jump over to Matt and, um, you know, it was a good learning experience. I learned a lot from Matt. Um, you know, so it's as athletes, I think, you know, we get complacent with the same coach and I think athletes also bounce around way too much. Um, but I spent, you know, three and a half years of Chris, I was in Matt for almost three years. So, you know, I, I put my due diligence with them and, and they put their work into me and I learned a lot from both of them. And then finally, I just decided that it was time to just take over my own reins because I do want to expand my own prep business and, and make a name for myself as a coach. And what better way than to be the own, the face of your own coaching? You know, I, I always think it's kind of funny that, you know, when you are a coach and you're coached by someone else, you know, obviously we're, it's, it's hard to have an objective eye and I understand that part of it, but, uh, I thought the best move for me from a marketing perspective was to just take over everything myself. Are you still dealing with those digestive issues? Uh, yeah, I still deal with IBS. Um, you know, some days I can eat like a horse and, and take everything down and other days I look at food and I become gassy and bloated and, you know, I'm, I'm on a whole litany of health protocol supplements and every strong probiotic and anti-inflammatory you can imagine. It's just, it's definitely, it's a stress related response. Um, you know, and, and, and that comes to fruition when, when I'm training, uh, usually about midway through a workout, no matter if I'm even on empty stomach, when I start pushing myself hard as a stress response, I start getting gassy as hell towards the end of a workout. Um, I've always been one of those guys where when I push really hard, I'm running in the bathroom, I'm puking and shitting at the same time. Um, you know, it's just the way my digestive system works and you know, it's all related to the stress response from IBS. Interesting. I got the same thing, by the way, I got IBS my whole life. Yeah. And, uh, I've been able to control it now, um, through fasting. Yeah. I've been doing like a lot of intermittent fasting and that's worked beautifully and just keeping like my meals infrequent. Yeah. Just watching what I eat, like spicy food, onions, garlic, like I got to eliminate that. I can't be sh eat, messing with that, any of that stuff. So it's, it's, yeah, it's like growing up, my mom would always put onions and garlic in food and I get sick like all the time and yeah. we couldn't figure out why, but now I know as an adult. So yeah, there's, you know, the same way with me, there's so many things I can't handle. Like most vegetables, asparagus is really the only vegetable I eat. If I eat a salad, I am extremely bloated and gassy and I shit out a full salad. My body doesn't digest it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nuts, I eat nuts and nuts go completely unde undigested through my system. Um, you know, things like oats and sweet potato, anything that's high in fiber content makes me extremely gassy. So I can't even touch those. So, you know, my, I, I live off of rice cakes, cream of rice, white rice, uh, fish, a little bit of chicken, egg whites. That's, that's really the, the best things that my body can handle. What about fats? Or are you keeping it pretty low? Uh, so actually right now, um, playing off what he's doing, I'm doing um, intermittent fasting daily and I'm doing keto. Um, so, but my, you know, I stay away from, from nuts. Uh, I can digest cheese well, but majority of my fats come from whole eggs, uh, avocado, coconut oil, some almond butter. When it's, when it's digested like that, uh, already processed up, my body can absorb it. Um, so I've been doing, uh, I do like five days of 16 hour fasts. 
and then I'll do a, a full high fat day. Then I'll do like another four days, a 16 hour fast. And then I'll do a full carb refeed day and then go back through that cycle. So that's what I've been doing lately. So Brad, one question I got for you is my girlfriend, she's a registered dietitian and she specializes in digestive issues, you know, whether it be irritable bowel, um, Crohn's disease, things like that. We yeah. actually did a seminar this morning um, on, you know, healthy gut flora and things like that. It seems like every second person now has some sort of digestive issue. What do, what do you think is causing this? Do you think it's just all the artificial contaminants in the environment, all of like our um, antibacterial soaps, cleaning products? Like, what, what are your thoughts? I, I think it's a combination of all that, you know, and, and I'm as guilty as they come. I used to pour f- that fake butter, can't believe it's not butter shit on <laughs> everything. Like, you know, 10 pounds of Stevia, uh, Splenda sweetener on everything. Um, you know, our, our foods, like chicken truly is one of the, the worst sources of proteins that you can get the the way that it's uh manufactured and like this they have to put it in they have a soak that just it's just really not a, a digestible protein anymore um and all the other shit so like us as americans our our food quality is just absolutely terrible and i think that really plays a lot into it and again you know the overuse of antibiotics and antibacterial stuff you know, everybody and their brother putting any bacterial spray on their hands after everything they touch, you know, that actually does a body more harm than it does good. So Brad, a lot of our listeners love the fact that you're, you're a thinker, you know, like you're probably the only IFBB pro intermittent fasting going keto. Like you're not doing the typical six meals a day, chicken and rice. Like, like you're really trying to figure things out for yourself. Yeah. A lot of our listeners want to know what are some of the health supplements you take? Oh man, <laughs> there's actually I actually have a whole YouTube video uh, where I lay everything out and I talk about w- what I take. Um, so in the middle of the night, I have a combination of, I take VSL3, the probiotic. Um, then I have lactoferrin and lactoferrin is another uh, probiotic strain, but it's also very good for keeping clear skin. So if you have like mild acne issues and things like that, high doses of lactoferrin are really good. I take uh, DIM, which is like a nat- has natural a- anti-estrogenic effect. Um, and then in there, there's also a, a cholesterol product to help reduce cholesterol. I use Now's Cholesterol Pro. And these are all things that need empty stomach in order to be absorbed properly. And then first thing in the morning, uh, I have pretty much that same combination again with uh, some coffee or, you know, I'll do uh, the Shreddable from AD just because it's such a great pick me up and then with before meal one i use uh the kidney stuff um four pills a day of that on an empty stomach and then i'm using anabolic designs liver plus uh they're ravenous another regular digestive enzyme uh what else is in there uh, multivitamin vitamin C and a multi-mineral with meal one. And then an hour after meal one, I have uh, omegas, uh, CoQ10, ubiquinol, uh, D3K2. Uh, what else is in there? Uh, pentethanine, you know, so that's a whole heart health kit. And that has to be taken about an hour after a solid proteins absorbed in your body and it needs to have some fats to be absorbed. And then the next meal, um, you know, some Tudka, curcumin, um, digestive enzymes, and then another pack of that with my last meal before night, uh, before bed with, uh, the digestive enzyme ravenous, the liver plus Tudka. Um, I also do, uh, this natural heart, uh, blood pressure remedy, which is really high in garlic, NAC, things like that. So, if they go on my YouTube, there's, I explain everything and, and show all the bottles and everything that I buy. Um, but I probably take about 150 pills a day. Um, <laughs> um, one of my clients, Richard Helfrick, they can look him up. Uh, he's kind of a pioneer in, in overall health. He works with a lot of celebrities and things like that. He takes people with cancer and other various disease and gives them proper supplementation and actually can combat and reverse the effects of a lot of disease, a lot of anti-aging and things like that. 
Um, so he's kind of mentored me a lot and I haven't even scratched the surface on what he knows. And that's kind of a, a path that I think I want to go down eventually in, in the future is being able to help people and cure disease through proper supplementation and nutrition rather than just throwing drugs at them. I'll, uh, after we're done recording, I'll, I'll give you my girlfriend's contact info. That's basically what she does. Okay, great. If you awesome. want to get into it. It's, yeah. it's really interesting. And, and, you know, that's, that's the way it's going is we're starting to see a lot of the side effects, you know, all these big pharma companies are, are causing, right? So now people are looking for a more holistic and natural approach, you know, through diet and supplementation. Yeah. And that's why the ketogenic diet and things like that are blowing up because people are actually starting to see evidence how it's combating different types of disease like Alzheimer's and cancers and things like that. And so, you know, it's really starting to pick up. We, we've talked on this show a lot um, about the whole like six, seven, eight meal a day bullshit that um, gets parried around. Wh where did that come from, you think? Because, um, you know, I don't see it. I don't see the logic behind that because we never, as human beings, ate like that in our history. Like if I put someone in the middle of the woods or in the middle of the island, you're not going to eat eight meals a day. There's no fridge. There's no processed foods. So you got to eat what you can get. And then go find food. You don't just eat every two hours. So what's that all about, you think? Who started that bullshit? Was it Joe Waiter in the eighties with his magazines or what? Uh I'm not I mean, I'm not really sure where it started. I mean, I know that, you know, Arnold and them back in the day, they probably got in three solid meals a day. That was about it. Uh, I just think it comes from this perspective of of more is more mentality from everybody. Um, you know, obviously being two hundred and sixty pounds your caloric intake needs to be much greater than, you know, someone who's 150 pounds. And truthfully, when you throw a bolus of food at someone, the digestive rate isn't that great. You're not absorbing that great of nutrients. So I think someone thought, shit, instead of eating three gigantic meals where I'm feeling bloated as shit all day, I should break it up into smaller portions where things digest and absorb easier. And then that just became more is more, more is more than now you're having five or six gigantic meals trying to maintain such a, a, a massive physique and trying to build tissue. So I think it's just been a, a perpetual culmination of, you know, trying to reduce meal size to now we're eating five or six gigantic meals a day, waking up in the middle of the night, pounding a, a thousand calorie shake just to try to maintain muscle mass that we're trying to put on. Brad, how much do you weigh? Uh, I'm like 245. Are you, are you having any issues maintaining your weight, intermittent fasting five days a week? No, not at all. And that's what I'm trying to prove to people that, you know, I have clients that come to me and they've had digestive issues and I have clients that are really insulin sensitive. And, you know, I, I, I preach and, and pitch the whole intermittent fasting to them. And, and, you know, they have this bodybuilding mentality. Like, oh, I'm going to shrivel up. I'm going to shrivel up. I'm like, promise you, just follow through with it and let's see what happens. And months into it, their body weight hasn't changed. Their body composition has changed. Their overall clarity, you know, blood work has all improved, things like that. So it's, you know, me personally, I've seen it enough with my own clients to not even need to see any studies or evidence to know that it works and to know that you can maintain tissue. Well, I mean, the studies do actually show you don't lose muscle mass right. by intermittent fasting. So I don't right. understand why people see here's the mentality that people don't understand when it comes to any fasting is they watch Gandhi and <laughs> they see Gandhi in bed. He starved himself to death because his country was having a civil war and killing each other. He starved himself for death. He wasn't lifting weights while he was fasting. So right. you're, you're comparing starving yourself to death on in a, in a bed being bedridden to an athlete who actually works out. You know, right. that's, that's, you're comparing apples to oranges. And number two, a lot of people who do fasting, maybe they're hippies or something and they, they're already skinny as it is. Cause they're like skinny hippie types. So you got to compare apples to apples when you're doing this, let's compare bodybuilders who fast versus, you know, other bodybuilders before we start saying, Oh, you lose muscle and stuff because you know, it, it just doesn't, it's not really a fair comparison. You see Rami move, losing much weight when he has to fast for Ramadan? Yeah, oh, exactly. yeah I didn't think of that. You see big Rami losing much weight when he has to fast for Ramadan? You know, it's he's maintaining 350-something pounds fasting for, you know, what, 20-something hours a day at sometimes? 
during the holiday. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah, I just, uh, you know, it's, it's the whole like mentality um, of the bodybuilder, the, the meathead bodybuilder that you have to like eat like eight steaks a day to, to keep your way. It's just because it, I don't, I don't know. I it just, in my experience, it just seems to me that it's not food that builds muscle. It's lifting weights in resistance training that builds your muscle. And it's, you know, diet can lose, you, you can lose body fat through diet. You know, it's kind of like the whole cardio. Let's lose body fat through cardio. But if you go to the gym, the average Joe is on the elliptical for 50 minutes every day and they're still fat. Like what the hell is going on? It's because their diet is shit. So it's kind of like you're comparing apples to apples. So I think people need to start thinking outside the box. So I'm happy, you know, guys like you are kind of, you know, bringing light to this, you know, and it's not just like a, some skinny hippie who's 110 pounds like right. Gandhi who's talking about this stuff. So that's, that's what we need more of, I think. John Meadows has done a lot with it as well. And he's done a lot on his YouTube, you know, and he gets a lot of traction. So um, I think some people have kind of seen on that, but I've been fasting for a few years, especially during my, my down phase and when I'm trying to heal and recover, uh, you know, our digestive systems take such a hit and it's just so inflamed and your digestive system can't heal when it's constantly digesting food. You know, it needs a period where there's nothing in there. They, the, you know, healing process can actually occur. So when you're constantly throwing food at it, you know, you get issues like leaky gut syndrome and, and malabsorption and things like that when you're just continually pushing the gas. And I think that's what bodybuilders don't understand. You can't be in a continuous state of growth all the time you need to hit the brakes once in a while you need to let your body recover in order to progress brad talk to us a little bit about fasting so when you say that you're intermittent fasting are you doing like the bulletproof coffee with butter are you, you know, drinking amino acids like like when you're fasting what, what exactly does that mean for you because everyone has a different definition of fasting i am doing 100 percent true fasting where the only things i'm ingesting are coffee and uh, black coffee no sweeteners or anything like that and water for 16 hours. So I typically have my last meal around 8.30 p.m. And then from that point on, I'm drinking nothing but water. And in the morning, I'll have like a, like a little bit of uh, cold brew coffee, black, no sweetener, nothing, until about 12.30. And then I have my first, right now, my first nutrient is uh, I'm doing a, a, a bone broth collagen protein with uh, a super greens and some chai seed flour to you know help with the recovery process the the collagen peptide protein is really good for recovery um and then i have about 30 minutes later i'll have right now i'm doing six whole eggs with some guac and a little bit of grass-fed butter for meal one and then i'll wait about three hours and have another meal of three ounces of beef and probably get another 45 to 50 grams of fat with that and then another three hours later i'll have like three whole eggs with two ounces of beef and another 30 to 40 grams of fat on top of that. Now, are you training fasted? Uh, yes. Sometimes I do in the morning. So I go in and I'll do my, I still do cardio every day. Uh, so I go in and I'll just do a little bit of abs, a little bit of cardio. I take in no aminos whatsoever. Um, and you know, just, I drink alkalinized water in the morning. Um, during my fasted period, I think alkalinized water is pretty pointless when you start to eat because the food we ingest is so acidic that it kind of just wipes out the whole alkalinity of the water. So it's just a waste of money. Um, but, you know, during a fasted period, I, I do find it beneficial. Um, and I'll train. Obviously, I'm not killing it right now anyway, but, um, you know, I'll still hit my left arm and, and some, you know, left pec and left delt, and I'll do that completely fasted. Talk to us a little bit about your training and about your mental function when fasted. Because I feel like a lot of our listeners are kind of scared to, to work out fasted because they think, oh, I need carbs for a pump. You know, I need carbs before my workout. Have you noticed your performance decreasing at all training fasted? Not really. I actually perform better. So in the off season, when I am trying to get in a more caloric surplus, um, it, uh, technically it's not truly fasted, I would say, but I don't have any solid foods in me. I'll do like 30 grams of aminos, BCA, EAA with a, with a pump product pre-train and I get a much better workout because me personally, 
with the IBS issues and things like that, when I eat, I get bloated. And when you're bloated, try doing squats or deadlifts, you know, or any bent over movement when every time you move, you feel like you're going to puke. So I'll do the aminos pre-train. And then after I train from that point out, I'll eat, um, you know, so I'll drink aminos during as well. So I probably get in about 60 grams of BCA, EAA mix between pre and intra while I'm training. And then from there on out is solid foods the rest of the day. Um, and I've seen significant growth off of that over the last two years training like that in the mornings. I don't have any science to back this up, but this is just a theory of mine is that when you weight train, you're basically causing a stress response to your body. And then your body is building those muscles bigger and stronger. Your body's basically going like, Holy smokes, our chest wasn't ready for that, you know, workout we just did. Let's make our chest bigger and stronger. So we're ready the next time that happens. Right. Theoretically training fasted, would elicit a bigger stress response because your body has no nutrients, right? You'd basically be putting more inflammation, everything on that muscle. So you would think you would theorize that it would actually make you more anabolic after your workout. Again, this is just a theory of mine, but if you think about it, it would make sense that training fasted would actually be better for muscle building. Yeah. And, and I can see that because you, you still get, a huge carryover from the meal the night before, you know, so you're not, it's not like you have absolutely no energy storage in your body whatsoever, whether it be, you know, you're, you're on a carb diet, you have glycogen stores within your liver and within your muscles still. So there's still energy reserves to be pulled from that. You're going to get enough energy to push through the workout and it's going to help fuel the muscles and everything to perform properly. Um, you might see a little dip of in, in endurance and maybe a little dip in strength, but as far as the rebuilding process, the rebuilding process occurs post train. So as long as your nutrition is on point from that point after, I can definitely see where you're coming from with that. So we have a question from Kenny. Will you ask Brad how he goes about post show rebound slash reverse dieting and emphasis on staying lean in the process would be great. Uh, for me, I've never been, well, over the years of just competing so much, um, I don't really crave a lot after the show. For me, it's like maybe a nice cold sangria or something like that to quench thirst. And honestly, like a big Caesar salad and a cookie and I'm cool. And then the next day it's kind of clean eating for a little while. And then I might go get a burger or something like that. But for me, cleaning and eating is just a lifestyle. You know, it's just what I do on a daily basis. So, you know, I don't have overwhelming cravings that just kind of make me go off track. And I, I've had a rebound before where it was terrible and that's just something I never want to go down, you know? So, you know, it's okay if you take a couple of days off from the gym, just don't go ballistic with eating, you know, get back into your daily routine. Um, you know, enjoy a meal post show, enjoy a meal, maybe Sunday night and then clean it up for a few days and maybe enjoy another meal Wednesday or Thursday, but just, don't continuously berate yourself with just high caloric junk food. Steve, do you got any listener questions for Brad? Or do you want me to keep going? Yeah, I'm going to um, bring up the next one, but go ahead and ask them and I'll bring up the next one. Okay, I'll do one more. So Brad, a couple of our listeners asked, um, you got into bodybuilding a little bit later on in life. Like, I don't think you actually started bodybuilding until you're in your mid twenties. Where did this, where, like, where did this idea to, to start competing come from? Um, so I, I actually never even knew shit about bodybuilding until I was in college. One of my college roommates brought home um, pumping iron. That was really the first introduction into the world of competitive bodybuilding I'd ever seen. Um, my life was football, you know, sports. Uh, my dad was a horse trainer. So, you know, bodybuilding was never, never in my life. Um, so I'd always kind of, you know, gym was, was what I love to do and I love to train. And I'd always been a gym rat because of athletics and, I guess I trained kind of a combination bodybuilder to look good for chicks on the beach and have a good physique, but then also as an athlete. Um, and then in 2010, I was found by a modeling agency, a fitness modeling agency to, to do some fitness modeling. And I was like, all right, if you, if I get paid for it, I'll do it, but I'm not going to, you know, pay some photographer to get shots and all this shit and go to auditions, blah, blah, blah. I ended up booking a shit ton of stuff in a short period of time. And the agent was like, you should step on stage. Just going to help get you exposure. 
you know, we can get more shoots for you and potentially get you a contract. So I was like, all right. So in spring of 2010, I decided to get ready for my first bodybuilding show. And, uh, just so happened that I signed with universal nutrition like a week before I even stepped on stage with a paying contract. And I was like, well, shit, this is already putting money in my pocket every month on a monthly basis. I might as well just keep going with it. And after that first, I did three shows in a row back to back to back, uh, my first time. And I just kind of got bit by the bug from that point out and, uh, fell in love with it because I love the challenge. Talk to us a little bit about modeling. It seems like everyone nowadays wants to be a model. You know, it seems, uh, it seems like so cool. And, you know, I've done quite a bit of modeling and personally, I hate it. I find it mind numbingly boring. Um, but talk to us a little bit about that. Where, did you always want to model or, or was it strictly just for money? No, strictly just for money. I had no desire to be a model whatsoever. I had no desire to be in the limelight. I had no desire to do acting, any of that stuff. It's all about what the hell can pay the bills. And at that point, um, the fitness modeling, you know, kind of still paid. Okay. You know, it was like, Hey, we're going to fly you out to California for a weekend on us and pay you 500 bucks for a shoot for the weekend. I was like, Oh, that's cool. You know, what else am I going to do this weekend? So that's kind of why I got into it. But you know, as far as like wanting to stand in front of a camera and smile and shit like that, I still feel awkward as hell. And I've done hundreds and hundreds of shoots at this point. So, you know, it's, definitely not anything I had set out to do in life. You know, I wanted to be a doctor. That was my lifelong goals. And this kind of derailed everything from being a doctor and I wouldn't change it for the world, but you know, so that was my dreams and aspirations was to be an orthopedic surgeon. Ooh, I've never, I've never, I've, I've seen a lot of your interviews. I've never heard that before. What, what happened? Like, why didn't you end up going to med school? Uh, so I went to grad school. I got my grad degree. And it was that year. Oh, my computer's dying. I'm going to try to plug this thing in. Yeah, um, anyways. It this, was, Brad, this is hilarious because I'm about to finish my master's and I'm, I'm planning on doing med school after. Okay. So I, I just finished up grad school. I went to uh, Drexel in Philadelphia, did a program that was focused on getting students into professional school, whether it be veterinary, medical, dental, et cetera. Um, I got kind of, I, I did very well in the program. And I was just broke. I had no money. And it was going to cost like ten to $12,000 to apply to. They're like, they, they tell you to apply to at least 15 med schools. And I'm sitting there like, how the fuck do I afford that? You know, I, my mom doesn't have two nickels to rub together. So I took the year off to work in order to save enough money to even apply to medical school. And it was during that year off is when that modeling agency came across me and uh, you know, I fell in love with bodybuilding and Ed Connors had flew me out to California later that year. And I came out here and I did, uh, the cow, I, uh, the Excalibur and one, and he convinced me to move out here. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to give myself a three year window of opportunity in this industry. If in three years I can't find some type of success, I'll go back to school. And three years later I was living out here, you know, making decent money, training people and enjoying life, loving what I do. And just the perspective of going back to school and putting myself in 400 something thousand dollars plus in debt or join one of the military programs where you become an officer and they pay for your schooling and then have to commit 10 plus years of your life to the military just didn't really sound that appealing anymore. Once you start making money on a consistent basis, the idea of going back to school and not making money really sucks. And so I just said, fuck it and uh, see what I can get out of this. Yeah, a lot of people did that. Bill Gates did that, by the way. So yeah. did Warren Buffett. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it worked out pretty good for them. And Michael Dell, and I can go down the list. Yeah. I think that Bezos from Amazon, too. He, did, yeah. he, he dropped out of school. I dropped out of school. So we have a user question. Um, he's a big fan of yours. He says, Brad seems to be a very straightforward and remarkably focused person. Can you ask him what his advice is for an average Joe to – get better results in the gym who is stuck basically in a, uh, who, who, this guy wants to kind of hit break his plateau. What kind of advice can you give him? Oh man, shake things up, you know, just, just do try a completely different routine than you've been doing. You know, if, if you've been training six days a week and you feel like you're getting nowhere, 
try backing things off for, for, you know, five or six weeks, just training four days a week, give your body more recovery time. You know, sometimes less is more out of things. Um, and then intensity, which is, is what most everybody lacks on. Everybody talks about, Oh, I train so hard. And then you watch them train and I'll, I'll put them through a couple sets. And it's like, no, you don't train hard. You know, you don't push yourself. And I think people lack intensity throughout life. Um, and one of my biggest advice that I tell clients is pretend like there's a camera on you at all times. Pretend like everybody's watching you because when you put a camera on someone, they become a different animal and they always train a hell of a lot harder and they push themselves harder. So pretend like everybody's watching you every single set you do, make it perfect and get everything you got. And that'd be my biggest big, bit of advice. Change things up drastically, do a complete 180 of what you've been doing. As far as if you only train four days a week, maybe go to six. I'm not a fan of double sessions a day. I think it's stupid. If you actually train hard enough, there's no way your body can recover in order to train twice a day. Um, but, you know, maybe so give yourself a little more rest and, and, you know, try up some different dieting approaches. That tip, what? Brad, that works so well. If you pretend like you're in like a motivational like football movie or something and like they're filming you, it, yeah. it, it works so, so well. Yeah. Well, that's why uh, the gym environment, I feel – works really good for me, you know, and because of that, cause it's kind of like you're being pushed by the peer pressure. And it's like, if you work out from home, I've tried that before and I just can't get intense. Cause it's almost like, I feel like in the gym, I have an audience, people are watching you and stuff. Right. And so it's kind of like that. I think a good gym environment is important. Do you, do you, do you work out like in a good environment uh, with people? I think that that can help. Yo, it's huge. I mean, we, we've tried having cardio equipment even at home. You know, it's like, I can go to the gym and ride a bike, spin bike, but I get here and try to ride the spin bike in my house. And I'm like, oh, that sucks. You know, it's just so boring. So just getting out there and stepping out of your house and, and out of that comfort zone where there are people around. And, and like you said, gym environment is huge. And, and, you know, the people in there, I have a gym that's close to my house and it has great potential to be an amazing gym, but you walk in there and it's just, dead and there's no energy and it's just like even for me who's an extremely self-motivated person it's really hard to get into the flow in training there but then on the flip side you go to some place like gold's venice where i train daily and there's just so many fucking people in there and you know it's it's just too much almost and even though the environment's great it's just too much of a zoo to even get really going because you know you, you get on a roll and all of a sudden you're trying to get to a piece of equipment you're like all right that one's used. I can go over here. Oh, fuck. That one's used. Oh, I go, oh, shit. And you've exhausted five different options that you can do for chest and everything's taken up. And then you, know, you got to revert and try to backtrack and find a piece of open equipment. So I think you can go both ways from having a dead gym and having a gym that's too busy. Are you still training with Charles Glass and Sean Roden? No, no. I stopped training with them a couple of years ago. I've been doing my own thing for three years now. Do you work out by yourself or do you work out with a training partner or your wife? Uh, I have a client that, uh, for the most part, trains with me as a training partner. You know, he pays me for the session, but he's been with me forever. So he knows that if I'm in a pissed off mood and I don't want to talk, we don't talk. He knows that I can joke around. Um, you know, it's, it's a great situation because if there's days that he's slacking, I kind of train harder to show him how much of a pussy he's being. And then the days that he picks up the pace and, and trains hard, it kind of motivates me to train a little harder. So either way, I get a great workout in. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to have someone for a push, you know, a spot here and there. But, you know, he's got a flexible schedule. So if I get to change my time any time of the day, you know, he can always maneuver around me. So are you still in New Hampshire, Brad? No, no, I live out in uh, California, in Venice. Oh, now you're in Venice. Okay. You're, so yeah. you're Venice full time. Okay. Yeah, I've been here for uh, seven years now. Okay. And um, how's the bodybuilding culture out there? It's probably the best in the country, right? Uh, the the best? Best. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, Honestly, everybody's moving to Florida. Huh? Everyone's yeah. moving to Florida. I know. I was going to say, because um, I haven't been to Venice, but I know South Florida, um, the bodybuilding culture here is, is insane. Everyone's moving to South Florida. So, uh, uh, too hot every for me. I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to get the hell out of Venice. Actually, this since I went to Dallas and got hurt, my wheels have been spinning, and I'm trying to figure out how to uh, make a potential move to the Dallas Fort Worth area. 
I really like it out there. Um, Venice, you know, I mean, you still got Sean Roden, you got Dexter Jackson training there. I'm there. Uh, it, the bodybuilding scene's a hell of a lot better than it was when I first moved there. I kind of got duped because one of the weekends I went there was the weekend of a show, the Excalibur, and there was a lot of people there. And then I went out and visited again during the weekend of the Flex Pro when they had the Flex Pro out here in California. So here I am walking into Gold's Venice and I'm seeing all these pros everywhere thinking that's what it's going to be like all the time. And I moved out here and there wasn't a goddamn pro that I saw besides like Jerome Ferguson and big Will Harris. And I was like, what the hell did I just do? There's no pros here anymore. But over the years, you know, some amateurs have started to come there and people have started to migrate a little more. It's just LA Venice is just so expensive to live that it's just, as a bodybuilder, it, it's extremely difficult unless you're ready to hustle. And a lot of guys don't want to work hard and make it work. So that's why this place has kind of died out from that perspective. Now Gold's Gym, uh, it's just, it, honestly, it's I get anxiety when I go in there because it's just, for me, it's just a tourist trap. All you have is every men's physique guy and bikini competitor who think there's someone special that comes there to visit and walks around with their fucking tripod in the air, filming everything. And they don't take care of the gym. They just leave weights thrown everywhere. So I'm just I've become so extremely burnt out of the reason why I moved across the country. So I'm ready for a change in my life and, and to kind of make my own gym and do my own Brad, thing. You think you got it bad? I live in Winnipeg. <laughs> I got it. I hear you. I hear you. That's why I left New Hampshire. I had to get people, out of there. People come up to me at the gym. They're like, bro, you're jacked. How do I look like you? I'm like, Dude, I'm six feet tall and 200 pounds. I'm a skinny yeah. guy with abs. I'm not jacked. Yeah. Well, live it up. Live it up. The big fish in a small pond thing. They, they can raise the time for the ego. I'm probably going to be relocating to the States next year. Nice. Just stay away from Venice. It's not worth it. It depends on where I get in. Uh, get into med school. Yeah. Yeah. Focus, focus on uh, education first. That's the biggest thing. If, yeah. if you really go down that path. Just well, remember, you gave great yeah. advice to that. If you're going to do education, don't take a break. Because once you're out of school and you start making money, you never yeah. go back. Just just keep just keep rolling with it. You don't know any different. Yes, yes. Tracking. All you young guys listening, it's true. Like, people want to take, like, six months off. My stepson, my stepson, he wanted to take six months off after high school before he went to college. And everyone was like, no, don't do it. He did it. He never went back. So it, it really is true. It's one of those things where um, don't get in that trap. So I'm going to yeah. let Trevor finish up the show. But first, we, we'd like to do a little thing for your fans, Brad, just to get right. to know you a little bit better. So it's called First and Five. So I'm going to throw five questions at you, random questions, and just answer them. Uh, the first one is, what music is playing in your car when you're driving? Lately, country music. Uh, really? Country music? Okay. Just From New Hampshire? Is. Yeah. I'm turning I off the slow down. I, I need to get in that Dallas country vibe, so I got to slow down. <laughs> Happiest day in your life was what? The day I got married. Oh, that's so sweet. Your wife will like that. <laughs> favorite? What's your favorite TV show? I don't watch TV. Sports Center. Sports Center, okay. You're put on a tropical island for two weeks. What are two things that you're taking with you? Uh. A big knife and a big tarp. Okay. And then last one, one bit bodybuilder or fitness celebrity that you'd want to have on your side in a bar fight is who and why? That's a tough one. Let me think about this. Bar fight. Cody Montgomery said Branch Warren. <laughs> I, 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 Branch might be pretty tough. He, he was one of the first ones I thought of. I'm just thinking about someone gangster. Like uh, like Chris Cormier was kind of a thug back in the day. I feel like Cormier could hold his own. Yeah, Cor Cormier was a wrestler too. So I'm, I'm going to take Cormier, my boy. It's good answers. So, Brad, for our listeners, tell us a little bit about your personal training business. Where can our listeners find out more information about that? Uh, shoot me an email at bradrofit at gmail.com. I offer one-on-one -on -one training services out of Gold's Gym Venice, which I'm trying to matriculate out of. Uh, but I do prep services online. You can reach me there for all those type of services. And uh, follow me on Instagram, Brad B. Rowe, and all my information on there as well. And then who do you work with? Do you work with everyone or just bodybuilders? I work with everybody, yeah. 
good. Males and females? Yeah, males and females. You know, especially on the personal training level is most bodybuilders don't even have the money to pay for training sessions. So uh, most of my clientele are um, upscale businessmen. Interesting. Cool. Does your wife help you at all with your personal training business? Nope. She has her own thing. She's a business cult coach and life consultant and uh, director of marketing. She's the head of marketing for AD, have just left uh, ProSups. So she has her own marketing business, consulting business, as well as life coaching. So tell us a little bit about AD. That's Project AD. That's a supplement company, right? Yeah, I've been with them for three years. Uh, they're kind of a smaller company on the grand scheme of things, but they really have a great cult following. Joe Binley, the owner, um, is just all about the brand. He literally, he's the hobo CEO, and all he does is travel around the country, travel around the world, and puts every single dime of his money into making top quality products and trying to build the brand. And, you know, they're all about integrity. You know, we sell to just brick and mortar stores. We don't sell to any online retailers because we don't want to undercut the little guy. Um, he likes to build great relationships with the brick and mortars that when you do come out with a new product, they know how great the products are selling. So they're more likely to pick up that product itself. Uh, a lot of top Olympians use a lot of the products because they, they believe it and they trust it. And we have some really big shit coming out, uh, dropping, supposed to drop by the Olympia, but I think things got pushed a little bit due to manufacturing. Some products that you'll see in Whole Foods, Walmart, things like that, that are really going to be game changers. Um, so there's a lot coming from the company and I'm excited. Last thing, Brad, tell us about your clothing line. Where can, where can our listeners buy that? Uh, I actually put a halt on my clothing line. <laughs> so oh. uh, yeah, yeah. We, we had some front row athletic stuff for a while, but uh, it just, it was too much of a headache for me and my wife to kind of balance. And then plus with me just signing with Gasp, uh, which is its own clothing line, um, it, it was kind of a, a conflict of interest. So at the moment right now, just uh, I'm team Gasp. Well, I'll let you know one, one guy who goes to my gym, and this is in Winnipeg, Manitoba. He has a, a front row uh, hoodie, but it's like, it's like a thin hoodie. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I told him, I tapped him on the shoulder while he was working out today and said, Hey, Brad Rose coming on the podcast tonight. He was super excited. Nice. So your clothing line made it all the way down to Winnipeg, Manitoba. <laughs> We've had some international orders, you know, but it, it's tough uh, trying to do the whole clothing thing. You carry a lot of overhead and, and shit like that. And you get burnt a lot with uh, online scammers. So we just kind of decided to put the caboose in it. We'll do some merchandise here and there for fans, but nothing crazy i agree with you man the clo the whole clothing thing it's a headache because yeah. you got to have so many different sizes so many colors yeah. and it's just and you, you, never, you never know what's going to sell and we're sitting on inventory like shit that i thought was going to blow up you know i've got hundreds of units sitting in my garage that we can't even give away to people and it's like great so i'll just collect a check every month from uh, a company and and push their clothing it makes it a lot easier i actually made a lot of money off this but i own my own clothing line and i made this limited edition hipster i like cat sweater for christmas it was hilarious right yeah. and i made 1500 of them yeah and i sold about a thousand but now i got 500 in like odd sizes and like odd colors and things yeah i might have a double xl if, if you want a i like cat sweater i'll rock one okay and the, the best thing to do you know send them to like africa and just a, a charitable donation a tax write-off for you i didn't even think of that that's yeah. a really good idea but there's sweaters that might be too hot for Africa. All right, Antarctica. You find some <laughs> some some Indian tribe like like when they did the uh, what was it Idaho or whatever where they had the the tribe trying to protect their reservation with the pipeline going through, and they needed clothing out there, something like that. Those situations will pop up everywhere. Honestly, dude, with how cold Canada is, I'm sure there'll, there'll be a place in Canada I could donate them to some homeless yeah. shelter. You'll find it. <laughs> the entire Winnipeg, uh, the entire homeless community in Winnipeg is going to be wearing I like cat sweaters. <laughs> and just think about it. You're doing a good thing for the world. That's the best way to look at it. Who cares <laughs> if you make imagine, one? Imagine like a tourist in Winnipeg just like driving downtown and like all of our homeless people are panhandling wearing I like cat sweaters. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, for your host, Trevor Karitsen, for my co-host, Steve Smee, and for our special guest, IFBB Pro, Brad Rose of another episode of Evolutionary Radio. Live your life, look good doing it. Thanks for listening.